Um, and then we'll send it out to all the folks who had RSVP'd um, afterwards. Um, so I recognize many of you, but if anyone is not familiar, um, BNRC is a regional land trust actively working throughout Berkshire County on land conservation, land stewardship, and community engagement. Um, BNRC conserves land to protect water resources, um, for wildlife habitat and climate resiliency, and to connect people to the natural world and all of the benefits that um, come along with that. Um, you may already be aware, but Berkshire County serves as a very important section of a wildlife corridor that extends from the Hudson Highlands to the Green Mountains. And um, corridors like this are really critical for the maintenance of ecological processes, including um, allowing for the movement of animals and the continuation of sustainable populations. Um, habitat loss and the fragmentation of habitat are two um, really leading contributors to biodiversity decline across the landscape. Um, so it's a brief intro about BNRC's um, place and talking about vernal pools and vernal pool protection. Our speakers tonight are going to dive into this key ecological resource in the Berkshires and beyond. Um, and we'll learn a little bit more about the life that they support and what protects them. Um, with that, I will pass it over to Rich. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here on the Zoom today. I just wanted to say thank you to all of BNRC's donors. I see several donors on the Zoom. I am the director of fundraising at BNRC. For those that don't know, BNRC is donor supported. So this program, all of the free guided hikes that happen on the trails, all of the conservation, the wildlife protection, the preservation of local farms and the free access to the outdoors on BNRC properties is all because donors make it happen. So thank you to donors for making this program and all of that possible. And if you would like to become a BNRC donor, I'll put a link in the chat so that you can do so. Thank you. All right. Um, again, please join us in welcoming Tom Tining and Emily Stockman. I'm going to give their bios real quick. So Tom Tining has been a professor of environmental science at Berkshire Community College since 1999. Previously, he spent 24 years as a field biologist and master naturalist for the Massachusetts Audubon Society. He also served for 15 years as an adjunct professor in the environmental studies program at Antioch New England Graduate School, Springfield College, and MCLA. For 25 years, he wrote a weekly nature column for the Springfield Union News, um, an authority on New England natural history. His main research interests are amphibians and reptiles. He has authored, authored the book, A Guide to Amphibians and Reptiles. Throughout the year, he conducts various short and long-term field research projects on vernal pools, rare salamanders, Berkshire butterfly populations, and endangered snake species in Western Massachusetts. He was instrumental in jumpstarting the installation of salamander tunnels in Amherst, and the Massachusetts Herpetological Atlas through Mass Audubon. Tom received both his bachelor's in wildlife biology and master's in, or in um, organismic and evolutionary biology from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, where he focused on the biology and conservation of the timber rattlesnake. Emily Stockman is a professional wetland scientist and the owner of Stockman Associates LLC, a small independent firm located in the Berkshire Hills of Massachusetts. Emily has been working in the field of wetland science for 20 years and specializes in wetland delineation, environmental permitting, rare species surveying, and vernal pool certification. She has been involved with multi-year field research on vernal pool soil development and hydrology within Hampshire and Franklin counties. She is a co-author of Soils, Get the Inside Scoop, published by the Soil Science Society of America. Emily has volunteered as a conservation commissioner, a Soil Science Society K-12 Soil Education Committee, committee member, and an instructor for MACC AMWS Conservation Commissions in various classrooms. Emily has a Bachelor of Science degree in Soil Science and a Master's degree in Wetland Science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So as, as those uh, very long bios um, imply, we have very um, intelligent um, people here and accomplished people here tonight. Um, so thanks so much for being here, Tom and Kate. And with that, I'll 
hand the mic off to you, Mike, or Tom. Great. Shall I start, uh, Mariah? Is that the plan? That would be great, Tom. Thank and you. Charlotte, great. Okay, well, thank you guys for that um, intro. You didn't have to read all that stuff, for you, <laughs> except for Emily's, which is much more interesting than mine. Uh, but listen, thank you all very much. And uh, let me start to share my screen uh, so that you can now see this. Uh, can you see the Spring Pools poem? Um, I discovered, it's kind of embarrassing being a New Englander, that I didn't really discover Robert Frost until my uh, college years, but uh, I did read through it. And when I was uh, going through his material, I found his uh, poem from the 1930s about vernal pools. That's uh, spring pools is another name for them. So is uh, uh, autumnal pools. So are temporary ponds. Uh, Emily can probably give you much more info than I can on that. And I'm not going to read this because actually I, I heard I have a tape recording of uh, Robert Frost speaking, and uh, he was very uh, rough and uh, deep voiced and. Uh, but his writing is outstanding. But here he talks about these wetlands in the middle of forests that still reflect the total sky almost without defect. In other words, there's no leaves on the trees when these vernal pools are most active. And so right now, uh, you guys couldn't have called for a more perfect timing for these. So instead of trying to read through all this stuff, I will suggest that you all go pick up a poem, uh, a book on uh, Robert Frost um, poems and uh, take a look at them. But today what I'm going to do is give you a, a little introduction on the critters that use these vernal pools. Some of you I know are very familiar with these, uh, I know, and others uh, may be uh, tempted to go out and look for them. The problems uh, with these animals are um, not small and I will do my best to try and tell you both the exciting things and some of the things we need to do still for their conservation. I should have asked Charlotte, can people hear me okay? Are you guys hearing me okay? Uh, okay, sorry, thank you. So this is a classic, typical vernal pool. It's in the middle of a forest. It is a shallow water. Uh, Emily will tell you more details probably, but they fill only with melting snow. Uh, runoff uh, from mountain, from hillsides, uh, spring rains, and groundwater if it's there. There's a lot of variations in these, but the big deal about vernal pools is that they typically uh, evaporate. Sometimes they evaporate very early. If we get a lot of 80 degree temperatures in May, they may disappear by uh, the end of May or even in mid-June. Some pools actually uh, stay full all year round, especially with heavy rains and might last several years before they evaporate. But still, they all do, some uh, in short cycles and in long cycles, and these evaporations make it impossible, as you would all guess, for a fish to live there. These are wetlands that are devoid of fish. They also vary in size. Uh, this top left picture is over at uh, Pittsfield State Forest. Uh, it is a pool that has uh, spotted salamanders and wood frogs in it right now, uh, at least their eggs are there. Uh, some of these are fairly massive. That bottom left one is at Kennedy Park in, uh, in Lenox, a uh, very typical spot, and the others are in other locations. Some vernal pools are the size of your house. Some of them are the size of your house at garage. Some of them are the size of uh, your table. And all of these, however, have these spectacular uh, characteristics to them. Typically, they're forested. Typically, they're isolated from uh, other wetlands. Generally, they don't have an inlet or outlet. Sometimes they do. Uh, typically, they're small, relatively shallow. The seasonal hydrology, as I said, they dry up at some point. And then there is an incredible rich number of organisms that live in here. Uh, often at the end of uh, winter, in the beginning of spring, this is what these pools look like. And uh, while the ice is gone, we get a snowstorm like we did the other day here in the Berkshires, uh, adding some uh, interesting view to it. But these animals that need these vernal pools deal with this one way or another. You'll notice this particular vernal pool completely, um, not completely, but certainly loaded with uh, 
uh, shrubs in there is also on the edge of a hillside, hillside, the bottom of a hillside. That enhances snow melt from the hillside going in there, melting snow on the ice of the pond in midwinter. And uh, this particular pool, uh, which happens to be in the Connecticut River Valley, is an exciting place to see a number of these organisms. The vernal pools are fed mostly by fallen leaves, leaf litter. The leaf litter in a vernal pool is really the beginning of all ecological communities because without water, besides fish not being able to live there, aquatic plants don't do very well. There's no underwater aquatic plants at all. Uh, if you go ahead and read uh, Robert Frost's Spring Pools poem, he will talk about this piece down here about trees uh, taking up that water from the uh, vernal pools and uh, using it for their own, uh, their own personal gain. Uh, this is called transpiration in ecology, where water is taken up by the roots of plants and then uh, is uh, excised in one way or another. The oxygen, by the way, that every one of us breathes, not to mention the, uh, the oxygen for these spring amphibians and other animals, comes from the water. It's broken down uh, during photosynthesis and the oxygen released out of the leaves of forest trees and other plants, other uh, photosynthetic plants, is the oxygen that we need. And so it comes from this little location. So as I said, they're relatively isolated. Some are in floodplains. The uh, uh, Berkshire Environmental Action Team is working on uh, uh, getting uh, the state and uh, the uh, federal EPA to deal with the uh, floodplain vernal pools along the Housatonic River, uh, where restoration is hopefully going to be continuing. Uh, and then oftentimes there are these fertile pool complexes where there's more than one, there's seven or eight pools even within a few hundred steps of each other. Uh, that's kind of a spectacular little location. Here again is just a quick reminder that especially the main uh, organisms that utilize vernal pools are amphibians and a number of invertebrates. Uh, that's a mayfly on the right. Uh, these are um, uh, Charboris, the uh, phantom midges on the bottom left that are and can be incredibly abundant in there. And that's important for some of the top predators that are here. There's two species of fairy shrimp in Berkshire County. Uh, although strangely, while I spend a lot of time and have historically in the Connecticut Valley, fairy shrimp are in almost every, every vernal pool in the, in the valley. In the Berkshires, I've only found a small handful of vernal pools of the many dozens I've looked at that have fairy shrimp. Now, the animals, these animals go up and down in their numbers uh, year to year, but still I am surprised and I'm gonna guess that maybe there's something to do with the pH of the water here. The pH is a really big deal. If you know fairy shrimp, or if you don't know fairy shrimp, this is a mom-to-be, this is a fairy shrimp, and this is her egg sac. These are half a dozen to ten eggs she carries in these pouches, and they sort of are shuffled back and forth to increase the oxygen on these little eggs that will be hatching soon. All of the fairy shrimp die during uh, the dry period, but their eggs that are left behind survive through the winter, in the dried pools and they will uh, uh, emerge next spring. So how about the main animals that I've been spending time with? And these are the amphibians. And here are some of the highlights of their activities. One is they have a very synchronized emergence. The frogs that are here in the vernal pools, particularly wood frogs, but also a little bit of the spring peepers, live in the leaf litter all winter long. They're here and get frozen solid. They're frog sickles. And these have the ability to withstand total freezing. However, when these things emerge the, uh, on these first warm rainy nights of late March, early April, uh, they all seem to just get it at the same time and start migrating through the forest and try to find these, uh, these pools or do find these pools. Uh, like the migratory songbirds happening right now, coming into your backyards, males precede females to these pools. Uh, in some species, like some of the uh, frogs, like spring peepers, all that hearing you have, all those 
times 10 to the 23rd are males setting up territories. They're doing the same things robins are doing in your backyard, except a peeper's territory is about one square foot. Well, it's a little bigger in some of the birds. Eventually, the females arrive, sometimes the same night, sometimes days later, even weeks later. In some species, they're very elaborate, short, uh, steamy courtships. And then as soon as the females deposit their eggs, they get out of town and go back into the forest. All of these adult amphibians go back into the forest. The two main species, well, I should say two and a half main species, that are found here in the Berkshires is the animal many of you are familiar with now, the spotted salamander on the bottom. And this other thing about the same size, that's mostly brownish with a little blue flecking, is called the Jefferson salamander. These do not have freeze tolerance like the frogs do. If they get frozen, they die. So they spend the winter in the forest, deep underground, below where you have to put your pipes uh, when you're building a house so they don't get frozen over the winter. So they've got to be two to four feet and maybe even more underground and nobody has the foggiest idea of what they're doing uh, about the 11 months of the year. Nobody has a clue. But they somehow know when those first spring rains occur, they emerge on the surface and they begin to migrate across through the forest to get to these pools. How they navigate to the pools is still a question. Uh, I have some suggestions, but that's all they are. Every spotted salamander has a unique spot pattern. You can tell everyone apart if you had no life. Maryland Floor at Pleasant Valley Sanctuary years ago has there's a small little pool behind the uh, Pleasant Valley Barn that was adopted by spotted salamanders and wood frogs uh, years ago. And she spent a number of years hand drawing the spot pattern of every single spotted salamander that came to that pool. And she was able to identify, I think, something like 110 different animals. These salamanders, by the way, live two to four to five times longer than white-tailed deer, whose lifespan at the most is eight to 10 years, uh, rarely longer even in captivity. But spotted salamanders, minimum known age span is about 20 years. And they go back to these pools, probably that they were born in. You might on rainy days in midsummer, having rainy periods, turn a log and you might find a spotted salamander, but all the rest of them are invisible. They are underground. They feed almost entirely on small invertebrates, earthworms, uh, beetles, uh, other insects for sure. Again, nobody has a clue what they do for most of their lives and how fast they grow, totally unknown in the wild. And we do know no freeze tolerance. However, uh, I took these pictures uh, in Lenox some years ago. On a rainy night, they started migrating and they came towards the pond that still had ice on it. They crossed patches of snow and they dove right into the water. This is really amazing for animals that don't have freeze tolerance and they just kept on moving without too much difficulty. Uh, if you look at this top right picture, if you can see it, here's a spotted salamander emerging from underneath the leaf litter on its way to a pool at night in the rain. This really drives uh, some of us crazy in trying to figure out how then do they find these pools? How do they know where they're going? Uh, it certainly appears that these same animals go to the same pools, probably the ones they were born in eight to 10 years ago. On the bottom left is the only time I happened to see some spotted salamanders walking through a tire track in the middle of the forest up in New Hampshire. And these are the only footprint photographs I know of salamanders. So I'm gonna become rich and famous selling those things, I'm sure, because nobody in their life would want one. Again, at this time of year, near the vernal pools, you might be able to flip a log and see, oh, here's one, here's two, here's three adult spotted salamanders. Uh, these are either coming into the pond, but more likely they've already bred and are leaving the pond and they need cover, rocks, logs, bark, whatever, before they move further away. And how far they move has been studied in a number of cases, people putting up drift, fence, drift fences to uh, um, see just how far they go. Most of them go just a few dozen meters. Some go further, and when we were first starting to learn about these things back in the 1970s, we found salamanders nearly a half a mile from their vernal pools. And again, how in the world do they find them? The males arrive first of the spotted and Jefferson salamanders. They go through, a, they get to be a large group. In fact, a group of salamanders you must know is called a congress. 
more intelligent than others you have been reading about in other places, a congress of salamanders. The males deposit these things called spermatophores, and they do drop them all together in these big clusters. If you go out in the daytime, you don't have to go out at night in the rain and see them. You go out in the daytime, and it looks like somebody's sprinkled popcorn on the bottom of the pool. They're all attached to uh, twigs or leaves uh, underwater. However, a uh, female, and uh, this is one of the earliest photos of these things, this is one big female arriving at a congress of males, and somehow, nobody knows yet, she chooses a male. It's her choice, and the two of them, <coughs> excuse me, go off together, go through a very elaborate courtship dance. The males deposit a spermatophore, the peep female will pick it up through her cloaca, that fertilizes her eggs internally. She then uh, leaves, he goes back to the Congress. In a day or two, she will lay these blobs of eggs and uh, this is what they look like. They are uh, about the size of a tennis ball. They uh, are come in two different forms, these clear outer jelly coats and you can see the eggs inside and the embryos. There's also some females, apparently genetically uh, contrived that will make these completely opaque egg masses. Why? Nobody knows. In some pools that I've been to, and first of all, you'll notice that oftentimes the spotted salmons will go to communal nesting sites. They will lay their eggs and uh, in, next to each other, typically low down in the water column. Why some are clear, some are not. Uh, I got a hint of some hundred years ago when a, a guy who was interested in these was watching a little pool that had spotted turtles in it as well as spotted salamander eggs. And he watched the developing embryos of the spotted salmon and you can see them in the clear egg masses wiggling every so often. He watched the spotted turtle noticing that wiggling and going in trying to feed on these. Is it possible that these opaque egg masses might be a good camouflage for movement of these developing embryos? Totally unstudied except for that observation. The egg masses are uh, attached to underground, uh, underwater twigs and branches, and the adults are long gone. These will take up to a month to hatch. They're very slow in their embryonic development, which is part of the story of these vernal pools. They have to develop the, they have be in the eggs, develop the embryos, they have to hatch out of here, they have to survive underwater for uh, weeks or months, and then emerge as uh, metamorphos, as juvenile salamanders, actually metamorphs, before the pond dries up. And in some years, there's 100% mortality. Interesting two things here. One is you might notice these little pointy things over here. This is a, a, a caddisfly case. Uh, with a caddisfly in there that is and can be feeding on these uh, these uh, small little uh, embryos in here. But you also notice this green algae that is embedded not in the outer jelly coat but within the eggs themselves. And recently a paper was sent out that people found that this um, jelly coat, that this algae coat, actually embeds inside Tom, you muted yourself. Um, there Bad you touch. Go. Sorry. Can you hear me That's now? Okay. Yes. Oh, just, sometimes it's better if I do that. Sorry. Thank you for that. So anyway, this embryonic uh, or this um, uh, very cool uh, oops, um, algae is now known to be a symbiotic uh, in a symbiotic relationship with a vertebrate. This is virtually unknown in the animal kingdom, but here it is uh, in our pools here. So you can watch the embryos developing. In fact, a lot of spotted salamanders used to be uh, collected as egg masses to be sold in embryology studies so that people could actually, you can actually watch cells dividing in here. Uh, and when they hatch, these are little external little things that hunt every little thing that's out there. To a tube effects worm, this is hell. This is something big coming after you. You just better watch out. Mosquito larvae big feeders on those things, and lots of the other animals that we saw, including fairy shrimp and the uh, charboris, the, uh, the other insects that are out there, the uh, phantom midges, but anything else that's in that pool, these salamander larvae are major predators. They're the top predators in these systems. Now, let me switch, switch over to this other big salamander called the Jefferson, and it's now the Jefferson slash blue spot. 
and uh, this is really a confusing organism. I'm sure there is some on, I guarantee there's some on BNRC properties that you should get out and take a look at. The Jefferson salamander is big and mostly darkish with slightly blue flecks. The blue spot is only about four and a half inches long, very darkish with big blue spotting on it. Turns out that these animals, here's a perfect good Jefferson salamander, uh, are probably hybridizing and that the vast majority of these big Jefferson-like blue spotted things are uh, all females and they have an extra set of chromosomes. They're triploids. Some are even have a, a, a two extra sets of chromosomes. They're called tetraploids. These animals being all females apparently have to survive in pools that have male 2N regular genetically uh, unmodified uh, Jefferson salamanders, yet when they pick up the spermatophore, the egg and sperm never unite, and yet the female then goes ahead and lays viable eggs. Uh, apparently they need to have some, uh, some uh, excitation of the sperm to get the egg starting to develop, but it's still a very ongoing research. So here's a typical Jefferson egg mass. They're not as round as the spottings. They're elongated, and many of them are unfertile and die very quickly. But there are always a few fertile ones in there. Not always, but mostly. <clears throat> the wood frogs are actually the first breeding frogs of the year, although most of us don't hear it that way. We hear the peepers because their sounds can travel incredible distances. Wood frogs have two uh, voice uh, pouches on the, basically in their armpits. So when they quack, wah, 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 their armpits go up and down, their arms go up and down, and they quack around here. Now, wood frogs do not waste any time. They're only in this pool for about five to eight days. The males arrive first, quack, quack, quack. Females will arrive shortly thereafter. And anything that moves in the water, the males will come over and clasp. And if they clasp another male, the male that gets grabbed gives a little let me go, please, let me go, let me go, and that male will release it. If it grabs a female, they don't have a release call and the male hangs on. The female then swims over with the male glommed onto her, and they, the female will lay eggs while the male reduces, uh, uh, releases sperm in the water. External fertilization in the frogs, internal in the salamanders. And they also lay their eggs, uh, sorry, in these, um, uh, communal nesting sites. Normally, the wood frogs lay their eggs on the surface of the water, as opposed to the spotteds and jeffersons, which are down below, which allows something interesting to happen. One is that the because they're closer to the surface, they get more sunlight and therefore uh, are warmer, uh, get warmed faster and hatch quicker. In addition, when they have these communal nesting uh, sites, uh, I've used a, a laser uh, temperature gauge and found that the ones in the center, the egg masses in the center, are one to two degrees centigrade warmer than the ones on the outside, meaning they're going to have a faster development. When they hatch, the tadpoles of wood frogs uh, swim in uh, groups and uh, uh, swim through the water like little tiny whales. They're doing the same thing whales are doing. They're taking in phytoplankton. It's not as big a mouth as a blue whale, I understand, but they are doing exactly the same thing in these vernal pools. The spring peepers that are here uh, are just uh, uh, wonderful. They're not classic vernal pool users, although they will use them. They're much happier in swamps, that is to say, excuse me, in, in wetland marshes where there's more grasses and uh, sedges. But peepers will use this, unlike the two armpit vocal sacs of a wood frog. Male peepers have one single throat pouch like many frogs do, and these males are absolutely uh, maintaining a little square territory, a one square foot territory. Females pick and choose males, nobody knows how or why, and they uh, will go off and lay little clusters of, uh, little clusters of eggs. Oops, here's a little cluster of eggs that they have. Peepers at full size, the females are larger, get to be three quarters of an inch long. Males rarely more than a half inch long. And of the tens of thousands of peepers you're hearing right now in some wetlands, all males are singing. They laying eggs, multiple eggs, maybe 50 to 100 eggs per female. 
I promise you, if you go to a BNRC property in August and try and find a peeper, if you find more than 10 in a day, you can get a scientific paper at it. Nobody knows where peepers go in the summer. And I'm sure there's a song somebody could make up about where have all the peepers gone. However, it's a spectacular story of one of the most abundant animals we have here, uh, and nobody knows. These same nights that these big salamanders and the wood frogs and peepers are moving across uh, the roads, we've now begun to see this tiny little salamander that is not something that you're normally going to see under logs. It's called a four-toed salamander. Underneath, they're pure white with its black flecking. They hike through the forest, they cross roads, unfortunately, as the other animals are, and get a lot of mortality that way. But these female, male and female four-toes go to the edges of marshes, uh, often beaver ponds, where there's a lot of uh, sedges growing, tussock sedges in particular. The males and females go through an elaborate courtship dance. The males deposit spermatophores, the females pick them up. And then several females at a time will go inside sphagnum within a uh, a tussock sedge and deposit eggs in the vegetation above the pool of water. They're terrestrial eggs and the females will stay with them to protect them. Eventually, once the embryos are big enough, they bust out of their eggshell and then squiggle down through the sphagnum through the tussock sedge into the water that's below. Terrestrial eggs, aquatic larvae. And it would be, uh, most of the places you've seen have already, uh, vertical pools, if you've been to, you will see red spotted newts in there. And it's kind of an interesting thing. Newts are unique in some uh, respects to um, certain wetlands. And these certain wetlands in particular, oops, sorry, are uh, beaver ponds. In fact, when beavers were wiped out of New England by the mid-1800s, and they didn't come back until 1932, first in Stockbridge and at the same time at Pleasant Valley Sanctuary. The Stock or West Stockbridge ones got there apparently on their own. The Pleasant Valley ones got there by <clears throat> three animals taken out of New York and brought over and dumped into a giant fenced area at Pleasant Valley. And uh, the people who were working there thought this would be a great idea. They didn't know if they could get them done, but they built this giant fence. The beavers, uh, they went out the next morning, the beavers started making a dam just fantastic uh, outside the fence. They didn't have to boodle the fence at all. And Pleasant Valley Sanctuary in Lenox is the longest populations of beavers in Massachusetts. And that West Stockbridge population, these two started repopulating these animals where they never were. This salamander, the red spotted newt, needs pools of water to live in, typically permanent bodies of water. However, some of you already know, if you watch some of the BRC wetlands, beaver ponds are not particularly permanent. In fact, they're not permanent. They have a 15 to 20, sometimes a 30 year lifespan. In that period of time, most of the trees around there that are good for food are not particularly available anymore. And so the beavers abandon that pond. They go upstream or downstream and start to build, uh, build a dam, build a new pond, a new lodge. And in the 10 or 15 years, that first pond may have reforested with the food they like, especially aspens and a few other trees, and they may move back eventually. So beaver ponds are not permanent. And these salamanders, the red spotted newts, seem to be especially co-evolved with beavers. The adults are live in water. They go through a courtship, um, can block your eyes if that's offensive. Uh, they lay little packets of eggs here and there. The eggs hatch into little larvae with the little gills. They spend the summer in the pond eating every little aquatic insect they can. At the end of the summer, they lose their gills, develop lungs, pop out on land, and turn fluorescent orange. You've all seen these on a rainy day walk that you guys keep running in BNRC and uh, hiking, hiking through the forest. You'll see these red Fs. In fact, these things were thought to be a different species of salamander than these first ones, than the adults, because they're so different. They're terrestrial. They're orange. The adults are green and aquatic. In fact, they were given the name red eft, E-F-T, as if they were a different species from the red spotted newts. We now know that these red Fs are what comes out of the eggs and the larvae of the ponds. Now we also know, we used to think only three to five years, at 10 to 12 years, they live on land doing nobody knows what, but they will eventually go back and sometimes use vernal pools, especially those long lasting ones. 
There's a lot of other things to see in these vernal pools. You can find these uh, here on the right is a yellow albino Jefferson salamander triploid female thing that was found in Pittsfield State Forest 10, 20 years ago. And uh, this thing laid eggs uh, and the eggs uh, hatch into larvae that had tiger stripes on them. Uh, the only one that's ever been found in Berkshire County. Here's a red spotted newt with one, two, three, four, five legs. What? Here's a spotted salmon, one, two, three, four, five legs. Multiple legs on these, uh, very strange. Here on the bottom right is a spotted salamander without spots. Give me a break. Here's one with white spots instead of red, instead of yellow ones. Lots of things going on we know nothing about. The earliest studies of uh, acid precipitation in the Northeast uh, were done often with these uh, vernal pools. And the acidity in these pools, especially in the valley and in the uplands uh, uh, here, are really pushing it. Uh, to understand that, we've done a lot of research. These are uh, pitfall traps that I put up here in Lenox years ago to capture migrating salamanders and frogs. We can mark them, measure them, release them into the ponds. You also have heard for years about a lot of diseases affecting amphibians around the world, especially pickerel frogs and leopard frogs. Uh, we have gotten lots of people excited. You're now wonderful little uh, uh, bucket brigades or salamander uh, crossing people that are really, really helpful because we have now put so many roads between the forest where they winter and the spring pools that they need to have. And this mortality is pretty rem remarkable. So on the left is uh, down in Sheffield, a little a nice sign that the state puts up. And on the right, some years ago, uh, people said to me, have you seen the, the uh, billboard? And I drove down to Dalton and there was a sixth grade that bought a giant billboard on a road and said, this is a baby salamander with a vernal pool. That's supposed to be a happy salamander. And this is a salamander without one, dead as a doornail. And I kept thinking that, well, maybe after 50 years of doing this, maybe the messages are beginning to get through. There's an awful lot to think about this, but we really need, the vernal pools are important. They have to be protected, but so is the land around them. And I will luckily and happily stop now and uh, we'll turn it over to Emily uh, either now or I don't know if, uh, if Charlotte, you want us to take any questions at the moment. I will take questions to the end and uh, pass it off to Emily right now. All right, thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. okay, some, some thumbs up. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Tom. Tom, it is always a very good day when I get to hear you talk about vernal pools. Um, <laughs> it's just a pleasure to be here. Mariah, thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. It's the perfect time of year to be discussing vernal pools um, with an amazing organization such as BNRC and the fabulous audience that you are able to uh, organize and, and gather here today. For this portion of the presentation this afternoon, we are going to shift our focus. Yeah. Oh, we are going to shift our focus from the biological aspects of the vernal pool and discuss some physical characteristics or traits. Our vernal pool definitions have a strong tie to the biological breeding wildlife habitat provided by these ecosystems, which Tom has just presented on. In fact, our regulatory protection requires proof of biological indicators. However, as we've discussed, these indicators are seasonal and are not always present during an initial site assessment. So today I'll be talking about landforms and mapping that can assist with the identification of vernal pools. And we'll also visit some unique hydrology of vernal pools, their soil development, vegetation or lack thereof, which can aid in the identification beyond the spring breeding period.
hydrology. Let's start here. After all, it's all about the water. We have a number of terms to describe aquatic habitats that are periodically flooded and, and temporarily dry. Sometimes they're called temporary pools, ephemeral ponds, or forested pools. These pools range in hydro periods. As Tom had discussed, some are flooded for only a few weeks, while others are flooded nearly year round, except for the driest summer months. The term vernal pool speaks specifically to pools that fill up during the spring due to snow melt, rainfall, those April showers, and a high seasonal water table at a time when evapotranspiration is not occurring, we don't have that leaf out, and an early spring when it's only just begun. The term vernal comes from the Latin meaning spring. This next photo is sort of a classic. <laughs> it's taken from an excellent publication uh, by the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, uh, a book entitled A Field Guide to the Animals of Vernal Pools, which perhaps some of you are familiar with. And what this collage is showing us is a classical in illustration of a vernal pool dry and wet cycle. The top photo, is showing us the pool during the dry summer months, lacking water and displaying some vegetation, particularly around the rim and the summit of the pool. But we do see that at the basin, the area is void of vegetation. The middle photo is depicting typical inundation during the fall season and the early spring. And the bottom photo is showing the pool at nearly full capacity with ice coverage. In this instance, the, the vertical pool may be um, categorized as an autumnal pool because we see that the hydro period has an origin in the fall. Is that fading out on you guys? Or is the screen staying bright? Looks good to me. Okay. Um, go back to there. Well, this photo collage um, depicts an autumnal, autumnal pool. The term vernal is still fitting as this collage um, focuses on the fact that the flooded conditions are persisting during the spring and the key breeding season for the amphibians that Tom had described previously. This is a classical collage showing the typical wet and dry cycles of a vernal pool. With that said, <laughs> ecologists as well as regulators acknowledge that there are exceptions to any classic rule. In fact, the regulatory definition requires that vernal pools be flooded for at least two consecutive months, a minimum, but they do not require a maximum period of flooding. So there are some instances where we have more permanent pool. In this map, what we're seeing are contour lines showing us that we have steep grades leading down to a low-lying area. And here we have a mapped water body indicating some permanent flooding of a water system. These pools are sometimes defined as a static ponds and that's to describe the unstable water level. The pools do have some level of permanent inundation but there's a larger expanse of that open water in the spring and the fall and the winter. And the persistent pool that may exist within the summer months is significantly smaller. In some instances, as Tom had mentioned, these pools may contain water year round, except for extremely dry or drought years. The interesting aspect of these pools is that although they may remain permanent, due to the high water temperatures as the season goes on and a low dissolved oxygen content, they are typically fishless and therefore make permanent pools favorable for breeding amphibians and invertebrates. Well, let's take a step back from that unique situation where we have a permanent pool and look at a more typical temporary flood, temporarily flooded vernal pool. Here we see a pool during the dry condition. 
right? Can't you see that vernal pool there? <laughs> well, you have some field equipment installed to help you. <laughs> this is a site in Franklin County part of a larger pro project where we were investigating the hydrology and soil development within our traditional seasonal pools. And what you see here are monitoring wells and redox probes that were evaluating water levels at the basin of the ponds, along the rim of the pond, and then at the summit of the pond. But let's put that equipment aside. It's pretty difficult to identify that pool during its dry season. So what other indicators can we look for when the standing water is no longer present? Before we head out to the field to do our exploring, it's always important to do your homework. <laughs> makes the field work easier. Fortunately, even for volunteers, there are several maps that are available to the public that can help identify landforms which may provide vernal pool habitat. Topographic maps with contour lines can be read to understand the topography of the site you're going to. Here with the green shading, we know that we're looking at an undeveloped vegetated area. And we have these steep contours uh, with patterns indicating watershed down to a low-lying area. Nowadays, we even have satellite imagery available to us. And the interesting thing about these images is that they can actually provide what we call dark signatures or wetness signatures. Here we have a forested landscape. We do have some conifers, this tan color that you see predominantly throughout the landscape. These are deciduous trees during leaf off. And these really dark black um, features within the satellite are wetness signatures that tell us that there are areas, at least at the time of documentation, that were inundated with water. So another reference map that we could use if we're on the hunt for a vernal pool. And then of course, we have the Massachusetts Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program. And the great folks here have already taken a lot of the hard work off our shoulders because they've looked at the topography that we just reviewed and they've evaluated the satellite images. And they actually have prepared a database and public maps that will indicate based on their desktop review, the sites for potential vernal pools. So those are those uh, blue circles with the dot in the middle are our potential vernal pools. And they'll also show you if you want to go out and visit a certified vernal pool indicated by a blue, dark blue asterisk where the biological data has already been collected, reviewed, and approved, allowing for protection as a certified vernal pool. And I always love to see these little ones where you have both because you know somebody saw a potential vernal pool and took that as a double dog dare, went out there in the spring, collected the data and got that baby certified and rightly protected. So these are some excellent maps that you can use. You can um, explore these references um, during the dry season. Um, my favorite is to do it during the bitter cold of the winter months when I'm daydreaming about the spring. And you can pre prepare yourself to visit these pools uh, during the breeding season. Let's talk a little bit about landforms that we have here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm going to pull up another aerial. This is out east by uh, Cape Cod. Um, and this is a feature, these are known as kettle ponds. And kettle ponds were formed during our last glacial period. And this was when blocks of stagnant ice would detach from the glacier. And then eventually they would become wholly or partially buried in sediment and would slowly melt, leaving behind a pit in the landscape. And in many cases, water would then fill that depression and form a pond or a lake known as a kettle. 
In many cases, um, these kettles uh, vary in size. They can be miles long or only feet long. But the one characteristic that they typically have in common is that they're relatively shallow and isolated. Smaller kettle ponds or kettle holes are typically fishless. A similar feature that we may see in the landscape can develop in limestone parent material, and these are called sag ponds. And what happens here is that over time, the limestone can dissolve, creating a depression in the landscape. And subsequently, that depression isolated in the, in the neighboring upland uh, landscape um, can be sufficient enough to hold water for a significant period of time. And when I say significant in terms of vernal pools, let's hearken back to some of those regulatory definitions, you know, that at least two months and needing to make sure that we have that breeding season. Another land form that I believe Tom touched on, this would be um, an aerial photo depicting an active floodplain associated with a low gradient river. And as rivers cut and bend over the decades and centuries, segments can become detached and isolated from the main branch. These meander scars, which we can see in the landscape, still have a hydrology that's tied to the floodwaters, as well as seasonal high water and runoff from snow melt. And so they can have a persistent uh, hydrology um, that is, again, fishless and conducive to vernal pool habitat. In this instance, we can see to the west that we do have a, a forested environment, and we talk about the importance of preserving that terrestrial supporting habitat associated with the vernal pool. But we also see where we have development and vegetation management to the north, um, the, the um, the east and even a little bit to the south. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, about the protection of the depression, as well as the adjacent, perhaps a buffer zone, um, or perhaps a, a terrestrial ecosystem uh, protected for, for other reasons, be it riverfront or for federal purposes. So here we're gonna go back to um, more of a classic presentation of a vernal pool. This was a vernal pool in the Berkshire County, actually taken um, after a period of prolonged drought, which we seem to, to have um, more often than, than not. Um, there have been a, a number of periods just in the last five years uh, where we've had um, droughts um, into the fall and I think it was only two years ago, my counting is all off after the pandemic, um, the, uh, a, a couple of years ago where we actually were in a declared drought by, um, I think it was in Berkshire County by May that that, that, had, that had fallen upon us, a lack of snowfall and a lack of rainfall during the growing season. But Putting that aside, let's take a look at this photo, which is sort of a classic representation of a smaller uh, pool, maybe the size of that kitchen table, Tom, rather than the house in the garage. And, um, you know, this is a, de a depression that when we're looking at our reference maps, it's maybe not going to be as distinct as a kettle pond. Um, and because of the limitation of scale with contour lines on our topo maps, we might not even pick this up necessarily. Um, as a landscape feature. And that's where the fun comes in. And that's why boots on the ground are required when we're assessing these fabulous ecosystems. Um, another interesting aspect about this photo is it really drives home that concept of these pools being isolated, you know, located in a forested landscape, but surrounded by forested uplands. And a little later on this afternoon, we'll talk about that, that concept of isolated versus being connected and um, the part that it plays in the protection of vernal pools or lack thereof, unfortunately. Here we have an aerial photograph with some polygons and other confusing demarcations on it. 
taking us away from an isolated situation to one that has connection. Um, this is an aerial photograph of some conservation land in Lenox. And it's showing us that not only is the surrounding upland area mm -hmm. uh, vegetated with woods, but we also have some forested swamp. This hashing indicates that we have quite an expanse of shrub swamp. And think about those shrubs in Tom's photos and how important those twigs are, right? When we're depositing uh, the eggs and looking for those egg masses. We also have some areas of open water that perhaps have emergent uh, vegetation. What you're not seeing here because the polygon is kind of hiding it is that there is a wetness signature and there's actually a perennial brook that flows through this wetland complex. But what do we see here? A little muted because of all of the distinction, but we have the same natural heritage endangered species indication that we have not one, but one, two, three, four, five, six certified vernal pools within this greater wetland complex, sort of along the lines of that series of vernal pools that Tom was talking about uh, previously. But it, in this instance, they're nestled into this wetland. And that is important in terms of protection because here in Massachusetts, we do not protect isolated wetlands unless they're of a certain substantial size, but we do protect bordering wetlands. And bordering means touching. So as I mentioned, there is a perennial stream running through this complex. Therefore, this entire complex would be protected as a bordering vegetated wetland. And even if these pools weren't, weren't certified, because our Wetlands Protection Act um, addresses wildlife habitat, the bordering vegetation, the bordering vegetated wetland containing the vernal pool habitat would be protected. But again, a unique situation as compared to our more textbook examples and occurrence of a vernal pool that is isolated and a standalone surrounded by an upland forested ecosystem. Those need a little more help. <laughs> okay, let me, before I jump ahead, um, we've talked a little bit about how rivers can impact our landscapes um, as well as glaciers and materials, uh, it, glaciers and, and parent material. But what else can impact our landscape? Let's think about that. Hmm. Well, of course, I know one species that does a heck of a job of disturbing the landscape. Of course, we do. There are several instances where human activity can result in the creation of temporarily flooded depression. This one has a happy ending, so we'll start there. Um, but the aerial that we're looking at today is of a historic quarry site. And you can see that, um, at least in part, the image is showing how it's nestled again with some supporting forest lands to the north, the west, and the east. This quarry operation was active before our present day regulations. Nowadays, we have more restriction on the amount of materials that can be removed, the depth of excavation as it relates to groundwater, and the requirement to restore or heal over these areas with a reapplication of healthy topsoil and the establishment of vegetation, but not so much back in the day. In fact, we can still see areas where the um, sands and gravels are still exposed and have not healed over with topsoil. What else we can see are these darkness signatures again. And these are areas where they excavated materials to a depth that they actually tapped in and exposed the seasonal high groundwater. And they did so so successfully 
that they created pools which persist long enough and of course have that neighboring wooded uh, landscape so that they can support the breeding of amphibians. I believe here we have the wood frogs. Tom had a better photo, but um, just an indication here on how we as a species um, can play a role in the creation of vernal pools. Unfortunately, there are other activities that our species um, takes part in that sometimes don't have this happy and ending. Um, ATV traffic, if not uh, properly um, monitored, um, forest cutting practices, boy, we have some stringent regulations here in Massachusetts, including the licensing of our timber harvesters, continuing education, best management practices. But all it takes is one bad egg and a skitter rut that's a little too deep. And that's a bad day for a wood frog. As Tom was saying, these are amphibians, both the wood frogs and the spotted salamanders, for um, example, that are migrating from these upland environments where especially with the salamander, who knows what they've been up to, but somehow they know to head back to these honest to goodness vernal pools. But what happens if between year A and year B, we had a large timber harvest and we didn't have the best harvester on the job and we've got skid roads that are rutted up like you wouldn't believe and are holding just enough water at the right time of year that these migrating amphibians come across the rut and I guess maybe get faked out on some level. Because what we see is the accumulation of egg masses within these ruts. But unfortunately, it is just a tire rut. So it doesn't have that unique hydrology. And, and if we go back and visit, as evaporation picks up, as the temperatures rise, we see a dry skitter rut with desiccated egg masses at the bottom of them. So, um, you know, sometimes we, we do all right uh, manipulating our landscapes, but boy, sometimes we really, really don't. So um, that's another area that always warrants um, post, post monitoring our timber harvesting practices and, and these ATV trails, which happen often on private lands. Um, unfortunately, those seasonally damp areas, um, uh, for whatever reason, I, I guess the riders find the mud more, more fun to muck around in. And uh, so you, you have these wetland ecosystems that'll get rutted up just enough, you know, to fake out a breeding population. Um, and then unfortunately will we'll dry. And then, and there you go, a total fatality in that instance. So a little more education and outreach uh, needed um, in those areas. But let's not talk about sad things. Let's move to something happy like soil. <laughs> so we've studied our maps. We looked at our ortho imagery. We pulled up the heritage indicators for potential vernal pools. We've taken a look at some topography. Now let's tie up our hiking boots and uh, and um, see what we can see out in the field. We've already done a great job. We listened to everything Tom had to say about biological indicators. We certified as many vernal pools in our neighborhood as we could, but now it's July. Everything's dried up, but what can we do in preparation of our next certification season? Well, we can start exploring um, for preparation of the spring. So we're gonna head out into the woods and our feet are gonna carry us downhill through the forested landscape and we're gonna spot a low lying area. But it's a hot July day. We're glad we're in the woods, it's still hot. And there's no surface water to be found, but that's okay because we have our trusty soil auger with us. So we're gonna go into that depression and we're gonna take a closer look underground. Here we have the first grab from our soil auger. And what do we see? Well, we have a very dark soil here in our hands. 
we can see that there's some moisture there, even though we didn't observe any on the surface. Um, and it's really rich with organic matter and it's dyeing our hands black, you know, as we're feeling it's kind of greasy composition. If we look through it, we may even see some remnants of decaying plant material. And what this is showing us is that we have a significant accumulation of organic matter in this depression. And the reason for that is while the depression is mm -hmm. inundated with water, anaerobic conditions or conditions without oxygen are developing. And the decomposition of all that leaf matter that we were talking about is slowed because anaerobic bacteria can break that up, but not nearly as fast as those aerobic bacteria when oxygen is present. So when you see an organic matter rich surface horizon in your soils, that's an indicator that there has been an oxygen free water full um, characteristic to this landscape for a significant period of time. The other great thing about this organic matter is it acts like a sponge because of its composition. And so it contributes to the water holding capacity of this depression and the seasonal pool hydrology. Okay, that was fun. Let's wipe off our hands and dig a little deeper. Oh, a second grab. Well, this time we're still seeing that it's uh, the soil is darkened by the organic matter, but now we can feel that mineral composition, some sand, some silts, and some clays. And what the heck is that rusty color in there when I open up my soil pet? Well, that rusty color is telling us the story of iron chemistry in an anaerobic um, environment that has a fluctuating water table. So in oxygen-free waterlogged situations, iron becomes reduced and soluble in the soil profile. But when you have the fluctuating water table, so it's going down, 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 which means oxygen is approaching, that iron readily becomes oxidized. And just like a rusty nail, we get these iron concentrations. So even though we don't have free water today, we know that there are periods during the growing season that for a significant time, we do have free water here in our soils. We gotta keep going deeper. This is just way too much fun. We continue down the soil profile and we've just got more colors coming out of us. Look at these beautiful gray soil matrix colors. And this is again telling us the soil, the story of iron chemistry in the soils. This is telling us that this matrix lower down in the soil profile is even saturated or inundated for a longer period of time, such though that all of the iron has been depleted or nearly all from the soil matrix, resulting in a glaying or a gray color in the soil horizon. But it's not all gray. What's this cool thread looking thing here? I see that rusty nail kind of look about it. Well, these are called pore linings. And these are an association with the root systems of vegetation growing within the depression. And as these roots go into the soil profile, with the roots, there's a layer of oxygen associated with the gas exchange of the plants. So as soon as that reduced iron hits that oxidized, that oxidized root zone, we have what we call oxidized rhizospheres. Cool word, right? Rhizosphere, so like, you know, the area of the root is oxidized and we can see that iron chemistry and that rust color. So even though we don't have any visible surface water, we know that this is an area that has significant um, saturation and free water within its soils during the growing season. What else can we look for? Well, the water's not there, but we've explored the soil. Let's take a look at the vegetation 
in the area, or as I like to say, perhaps the lack thereof. This is a picture of a vernal pool during the heat of the growing season. And one of the things that you notice we don't have in the depression is a lush green herbaceous ground cover. But we do see that around the perimeter. So why do we have vegetation around this depression, but not in the depression? Hmm, what could have been there to stop that? Maybe water? What else do we see characteristically in this photo in regards to the tree species? We're in a forested environment here. And if we look down, what we'll see is that we have buttressed trees. And that's a morphological adaptation of those trees to help assist with gas exchange during saturated and inundated conditions. So that's telling us that this area gets pretty wet for these trees, fairly sizable in their DBH, to develop that buttressed characteristic of space. Here's an example of vegetation along a pool that's in the process of drying up. So we see that we do still have some surface water but this sediment staining along the vegetation indicates to us that the water level during a wetter time of year was significantly higher. And in fact, we may still see this staining when the surface water is no longer visible a few months from now. This is another photo of sort of that classic vernal pool environment nestled in that forested um, upland. This photo was taken during the time of inundation. However, as the pool dries up, there's another indicator we can look for, and those are our water stained or blackened leaves. So we may not see green growth, but what these leaves tell us is that they've been underwater for a long time, man, and they are black and they are stained, as, compo as comprised to this um, oak leaf, which you see that has just, you know, newly been, um, you know, deposited maybe by the wind blown in. So there's a great comparison of a freshly fallen leaf and a, a blackened leaves that indicate to us an area has been uh, in. Uh, inundated and inundated for a significant period of time. Here's a, a picture of a vernal pool during the early March of, of one year um, and a little atypical in that it's not nestled into a forested environment anymore. Um, but this is a, a pool that has been uh, monitored by many <laughs> over many years. And we can see from this staff gauge that we have a fairly significant water depth here. This is March, you know, um, we don't have evapotranspiration. We've had some great snow melt. There's been some rainfall and we're a little over three feet deep here with our water. But what happens when we go back in late July, you know, after a really hot, dry uh, summer. What we're seeing here is that the water level has dropped to, um, in this case, I think it might be cut off, uh, to no surface water. And those wetland cattails that had been around the perimeter have been able to take hold and expand uh, into that vernal pool depression. So sometimes we will find vegetation within the depression, the basin of the vernal pool, typically um, wetland, obviously wetland uh, plants, uh, cattails. In the forested environment, you may see some sensitive fern. Royal fern loves to try to get in there. Um, but, but generally, when you're looking at the pool and the neighboring landscape, you're going to see a distinct difference in the vegetation. The growth that is there in the depression is going to be stunted, smaller in size, and that's because it couldn't establish for many months while the pool was inundated. So a little nuance that you may be able to pick up on if, in fact, you're seeing any type of ground cover there in the basin.
Emily, forgive me for interrupting. Um, I just wanted to give you a heads up that we probably need to wrap up the presentation piece in a minute or two just to have some time for Q&A. Um, but I know you have some important things to share. So I just want to let you know that real quick. No, I, I really always need that. But I think that Tom went over by like three minutes. So <laughs> it's not all my bad. <laughs> You're totally um, fine. No, that is actually great because that brings me to my final slide and maybe this will actually become part of the q and I did want to touch base on vernal pool protection. And here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as I mentioned briefly, we do have the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act, which does afford some protection to certain vernal pools. Um, Vernal pools that have been certified by the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program um, have a presumption of protection. Vernal pools that are located within other wetland resource areas have a level of protection. But those wonderful, beautiful, classic vernal pools nestled in our forested landscapes and completely isolated and uncertified really do lack a level of regulatory uh, protection. And so over the years, we have seen um, the e evolution of local wetland bylaws where towns will go on a, a you know, town by town basis and focus more stringent protection and isolated wetlands and particularly certified, uh, excuse me, uh, vernal pools that haven't been certified. Are, are a key component of those local bylaws, but not every town has those. And um, I will pause there since uh, I've been notified and uh, take it over to you, uh, Mariah and Charlotte, so you can um, organize the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you both so, so much. <laughs> that was a lot of great information that really tied well together. Um, and I love that we just were out in the field with both of you is what it felt like. So um, uh, while you were presenting, we did have one question come into the chat that um, I can ask and we can get going, but we have um, such a small group that I think if anyone would um, feel comfortable unmuting themselves to ask, ask a question, you're welcome to do that um, after I ask this one. So this was from Jim and he asked if um, anyone use, has used LIDAR data to snoop out potential vernal pools. And for those of you who aren't familiar, LIDAR is a light detection and ranging. Um, it's a remote sensing technology used to acquire elevation data about the Earth's surface. Um, very cool technology, but I'll pass that question off to you all. Uh, yeah, this is Emily. That is a great question. And I can say, yes, absolutely in the professional realm. And in the research realm, we have access to great LIDAR, which does have a more level, uh, a greater level of detail as opposed to the typical USGS topographic maps. Um, so yeah, no, excellent point. And we do use those on the daily. I don't believe that they are available as readily available to the public, but if you're aware of some websites, please do share with the, with the group. All right, thank you. Um, since I don't see any more questions I, in the chat, right, the second, oh, did, did someone raise their hand? Yeah, oh, it, it's, it's Jim. Hi, just just to, in response to Emily's comment, LIDAR data is freely available from the MassGIS webpage, and I have downloaded it in a number of occasions to look for stuff. Now, I don't know if that LIDAR data, LIDAR data is of the quality level that researchers might be able to have access to, but you can see some pretty cool stuff with the publicly available stuff. Jim, it wouldn't surprise me if it's available on the mass mapper now. You see, of course, now you're going to date me, though. So um, when we first embarked on using that technology, it wasn't available. So we had to go through other routes. And I honestly haven't circled back in, geez, I'm embarrassed to say maybe five years, if not longer, to see if it's available on uh, Mass Mapper. So that's great news for me to hear that you can download that and utilize it. All right, I don't see any hand raise, um, hands raised right this second. So um, I'll ask one of my own questions. 
Um, do either of you know if any research has been done looking at the effect of, of climate change um, on vernal pools, specifically their uh, lifespan um, and uh, yeah, during, during the breeding season? I can try and answer a tiny bit of that. Uh, there's not enough data on that yet, but there was a pretty big survey from Newfoundland to central New England to check on high elevation vernal pools. These are a little bit unusual, but uh, Mike Jones, a state herpetologist in Massachusetts, and uh, a couple of other people have been surveying vernal pools at very high elevations in distant areas. And they were trying to measure uh, success rates and interactions between different vernal pool species. And their assumption is coming to look that uh, to look at the comparison of these high elevations with some low elevations, the low elevation ponds seem to be drying faster, at least in the short two year study. That doesn't give us enough time to really say anything big, but that could be a really big issue, both with plant growth uh, uh, in, uh, added, added grant plant growth around the pools, as well as just evaporation besides the transpiration. So uh, people are very worried about it. These are cold adapted animals. Uh, the wood frogs and the peepers especially, increased temperatures are likely to affect them. And of course, that race against time between hatching and the standing water is going to be a very, very, it, it's already a very tricky item. And uh, uh, global climate change is not likely to help it. Thank you for that. Um, any, any questions from the participants? popping up. All right, feel free to unmute yourself um, if that happens. I, I also have a question <laughs> that I'll share and then we can wrap up if we don't have any further questions. But um, Emily, you spoke about this at the at, at the end and I'm sure you I rushed you through it, but wondering if you have any more recommendations on improvements or something you'd like to see from a regular regulatory standpoint when it comes to wetlands in general, maybe vernal pool connectivity, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I th thank you for that question, Mariah. And you know, obviously, I'd like to see um, a regulatory change that specifically addresses vernal pools, um, not only those um, located within another protected resource area or certified. Um, but another aspect of our regulations that really needs a, a harder look is um, this concept of buffer zones and supporting ecosystems. Um, here in Massachusetts, we do have a 100 foot buffer zone associated with the boundary of a bordering vegetated wetland um, or an inland bank. It's not protected, it's jurisdictional. The Conservation Commission has the authority to review it to ensure that any work in that 100 feet would not have an adverse impact on the resource areas. And we do have some groups like the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commission that have worked on some publications to help um, vet those buffer zone impacts, but they're not regulation and they're not performance standards. So it, with, without a local bylaw well written, um, it can be very challenging for conservation commissions to push back on that buffer zone development. And let's circle back to that 100 feet. I mean, given you know what Tom uh, summarized and the miles that <laughs> of migration um, that may occur, not just for our vernal pool species, but other species that utilize wetlands as well. You know, 100 feet is a number that's been around for a long time. Uh, I can tell you it's much smaller uh, than any ecologist would have recommended, probably too big for the lawyers that were vetting the regulations. And I'm sure there was a bit of diplomacy with some developers when they set that 100 foot. Um, you know, I can spend all the time in the world going around and assessing these boundaries and delineating them and making sure that these wetlands and pools are protected. But if we're gonna decimate the supporting habitat surrounding them, they are nothing but an island unto themselves without that habitat. So, you know, that coupled, with um, you know our recent climate changes and those to come, it's it's a real challenge. But I would like to see that. I would like to see more discussion on that the next time uh, 
they go through a revision. I think our last one was 2014, right, Tom? So we'll probably do for another one. So maybe we can bring that to the table with the regulators. Thank you, very important stuff there. Um, anyone else have questions? Participants, unmute yourselves or raise your hand. Um, okay, I will finish then um, with the last question, um, which is my own question. Um, do man-made vernal pools um, like uh, water that collects in, in old wells or um, other sorts of structures, foundations, um, do they differ in their in their species makeup generally or, or their ecosystem benefits? I know that um, some of them do have all of the indicator, indicator species um, necessary to certify, but I, I'm wondering how, how they differ otherwise. Well, it's interesting. The only, I'm going to go backwards on that. Uh, vernal pools are probably dramatically reduced since uh, early colonial days. There were probably millions of vernal pools that have now been destroyed. And people used to do two, one of two things. You either just keep putting branches and boards and logs and trash in and make it real land, or you dig it out and make it a farm pond. And I'm quite positive that an enormous number of farm ponds used to be functioning vernal pools. They're now in open land, and most people have dumped fish in there and kept the water permanent. So they are all gone. Uh, in wells, the smallest things, yes, some of these amphibians can survive it, but they need the leaf litter. They need this complex interaction of invertebrates, uh, microorganisms, and uh, uh, energy flow that starts from rotting leaves. That is the energy source. There's no effort of, there's no photosynthesis really in most vernal pools that's of any use. Some have, um, some have uh, algae in it, some develop uh, uh, floating plants, but most of it is all uh, disintegration of the, the leaf litter. And so without that, you might have animals in them, but the likelihood of long-term sustainability of the populations is virtually zero. I don't know how you feel about that, Emily, but that's sort of my feelings. You've, you've seen more types of wetlands than I ever have. No, I, I would I would agree with you, Tom. And that food cycle is so important. You know, that leaf litter and that detritus, um, you know, and, and with these anthropogenic systems, you know, I did have the example of that one historic quarry, you know, but it did have the, you know, the surrounding uh, supporting forest and it wasn't, it, it was healing over, you know, with some vegetation. Um, so it was, um, you know, able to sustain some breeding habitat there. Um, but more often than not, when I see anthropogenic features in the land, um, I go back to visit and what I'm seeing is, you know, dried up, desiccated egg masses. So um, uh, I think I think a real focus there is on preserving the, the vernal pools, identifying and preserving the ones uh, that nature created that are still in place. Um, there have been there has been research done on intentionally creating vernal pools. Um, and there are restored vernal pools uh, here in the Commonwealth. And again, it's all about that water. So we have some success stories, but we have some instances where the hydrology, that, that fascinating and unique hydrology just wasn't, wasn't obtained, so. Um. Thank you for that. I think I've read a few of those studies where they, they just don't serve the same purpose um, as, as the, the natural ones, but. Um, better than nothing, I guess. Um, well, thank you both so much for taking the time um, to share your knowledge and engaging ideas um, on ways, you know, folks who are just taking a walk in the woods can really begin to, to think a little bit deeper about vernal pools and the life that they support. Um, I'll open it up to any last comments or questions from the group um, and Hearing none, um, there's some, some good ones coming into the chat though. So pay attention to that. Um, yeah, we'll just wish everyone a, a wonderful weekend and to head out to your favorite trail or reserve and keep an eye and ear out for, for what you see. Thank you guys.
You're very welcome again. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Thanks for everyone for being in to, to join. Tom, always a blessing to spend some time with you. And I would just encourage people, you know, visit, visit those websites. Beat's got a great uh, website that goes through a certification process and get out there and, and enjoy it. And let's all do our part to certify and protect. Absolutely. We'll send some follow-up resources, ways to get involved. Um, I know BEAT does a lot of helping with um, amphibian crossings as well. So we'll send that information too. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you. See ya. <laughs>